Sometimes we need to slow it down Take a look around and breathe Cause these times go by so very fast Wounds never last Just breathe Breathe in, breathe out Quiet and still don't shout Tell us what it's all about Sometimes when you feel you've had enough, living is just too tough. Just breathe, cause you'll regret when these days are past. Your friend has seen you last. Just breathe, breathe in, breathe out. Good evening and welcome to the Just Love Show. Uh, it's a really beautiful night here in Northern California. I would pretend like we're doing the show live right now, but actually I'm, this is the first time we're going to pre-record it and we'll be playing it live in a couple hours. Um, like the song says, and we do every show, just sit back, take a deep breath, breathe in all the things we have to be grateful for, look around this world of abundance and realize that um, really anything that we want to make happen in our lives, we can. Um, I'll get us going with uh, one of uh, the things I've been writing for the past five years. Um, this is why I picked for tonight. Make peace with death, end war with life, love in harmony, not dissonance. And here are some quotes that sort of echo that. Love is how you stay alive even after you're gone, Mitch Album. Let life be as beautiful as summer flowers and death be as beautiful as autumn leaves, or Vendeth Tagore. Um, and now I'm going to get to a really, really amazing guest that I have on. I, I thought I'd done a pretty wide variety of things in my life from logging in Canada to being an electronic engineer or an electronic technician in the Navy to um, working as a male stripper, playing in rock bands to 15 years in local and sustainable agriculture. But my guest tonight, Paul Bundance, has surpassed anything that I've done <laughs> by leaps and bounds. Uh, he has been a software coding analyst in the nuclear power industry. Uh, he's written children's books. He's uh, the founder and creator of Kid Robot. Uh, he's created uh, abundance bicycles, which are considered the Alfa Romeo of bicycles. Um, just, I, I mean, I, I think that uh, the word uh, genius is often overused, but from reading all I've read about Paul, I don't think that that'd probably be a huge stretch. And on top of everything else, he created this amazing new social media platform called Ello. And what makes Ello really unique is it doesn't allow any advertising. It doesn't own your content. It doesn't own your um, personal information. Um, and I'll let Paul explain a lot about that and other things. But I want to hear really how this journey from high school uh, uh, coding, safety coding uh, uh person in the nuclear power industry to what he's doing today, how that journey led him here. And, and literally, like I said in the beginning of the show, if this is an example of you can do anything in your life you want to do if you open your mind to it, um, I, I think Paul's life is a shining example of that. So without further ado, welcome to the Just Love Show, Mr. Paul Bundance. Thank you. Thank you very much. What a, what a fantastic introduction. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's really yeah. wonderful to have you on. I was reading over uh, your history, and I'm like, "Whoa, where, what haven't you done in your life?" And you know, how did 
how did all this, uh, you know, start? Like I, I did a little bit of like coding and binary in high school, but obviously mm-hmm. not into the nuclear <laughs> industry. Yeah, you know, well, it was funny. I was really into computers as a kid, and my father um, was a Cal Berkeley, and he's a nuclear engineer, actually. And they needed to figure out, uh, <laughs> they actually needed to create software to figure out whether or not nuclear reactors were going to melt down and the probability of that happening. Um, so they looked around and hired me, <laughs> I think at that age, and it was a while ago, um, I guess a lot of the people who were writing code were pretty young. I was pretty young even for that, but that's kind of how I got into it. And I ended up writing software that <laughs> took all the probabilities of every part on a reactor break from breaking down. And you could, you could really, I guess you could add up all that, all that different stuff. And, uh, we came up with numbers and answers and um then it you know fukushima happens and it it really proves that <laughs> the human mind i guess has limits you know what i you, mean you you read you read my mind <laughs> yeah totally so um and it, it does make you question that they had you know 17 year old a 17 year old kid writing the software but i think it did a pretty good job for for what i was doing well con- considering it took uh you know quite literally an act of god to prove you wrong yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's, that's the, true. What's that? What's that? What's that old expression? Whether whether you're a religious person or not, there's some truth to it. It's man makes uh, totally. plans and God. I uh, can't remember what the rest of it was, but you, you know the, the general thing. So um, you went I, from I how long? How long did you do that for? Well, I, you know, it was funny. I I did I did programming. Um, it was it was just kind of what I was interested in in high school, and then when I about the time I got to college. I uh, swore I would never program again, um, uh, a promise I ended up not keeping, actually, but uh, mainly just because I didn't want to spend my life sitting in front of a computer screen. Right. I, uh, I was more interested in, in people, and, and actually in art, I ended up becoming an art major, and that led me in a totally different direction. Wow. Yeah, I, I, I've i had a weird, um, growing up, I grew up on a small farm in um, Washington, mm-hmm. In a small town in Washington, and mm-hmm. so I have sort of a weird Luddite relationship with tech. I, it doesn't. Yeah. I'm not afraid of it. I understand. I use it all the time. I was considered so to, sort of a thought leader in the world of social media as it was mm-hmm. developing, you know, a while ago. And even like I mentioned, learn how to write uh, code in high school. But it, I, when I was writing for BAM magazine, which was a Bay Area music magazine. Oh, you wrote there. for BAM? Oh, I wrote for totally. BAM. I grew, you know, I, I grew up in Berkeley, so. Oh, we, you know, my, my guest last That's week awesome. was Alex Skolnick, uh, who grew oh, up in Berkeley. Oh, far out. Oh, far out. That's really yeah. cool. And in fact, his parents yeah. were also academics at Berkeley. Wow, great. That's cool. So, so you, cool. you're familiar with BAM then? Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah, I mean, we used to read it as kids. Well, computers actually destroyed BAM because uh, Dennis, Dennis sold microtimes for $20 million and said, well, I got all this money. What do I need to keep doing BAM for? Right. <laughs> but they, <laughs> they I was... I didn't realize they were doing both things. Yeah, he, he owned both magazines. But they, I was actually, they said, well, you, you can't mail us your, your articles. And this was mid-90s. Uh, so I went out and bought a $25 word processor and was I was mailing them floppy disk. And they're like, no, this isn't going to work. So I finally went out reluctantly and got, the, and got my my uh, horrific Mac. It was not a good Mac. But it was, <laughs> oh, it was, man, I it, got a better story than that, but very similar. <laughs> when I was in junior high school, junior high school in Berkeley, um, I so this was my first business, actually. So I, I have some friends and I um, started a business selling, actually one friend and I really started a business selling um, firecrackers to our friends, which mm-hmm. as you know were illegal at the time in California. And we used to take BART to um, San Francisco to the housing projects, the Chinese housing projects in Chinatown, and then someone would come out the back and meet us with like a brick of firecrackers and stuff. By the way, I'm not recommending that people do this. This is not a way to become an entrepreneur. I'm just telling a, I'm just telling a story. <laughs> and we brought them back, and we told them to our friends. And, and I realized at the time that it would be really cool to computerize the um, the sales lists. And as a junior high school student, you know, we had access um, to a pilot program where they gave us teletype machines. So I wrote I wrote a program in assembly language that um, basically allowed me to enter all you know all my sales on the computer. And what I didn't realize was that that 
that terminal was tying into the mainframe at Cal Berkeley, which was on loan from the Department of Energy, which controls, at least at that time, the nuclear bomb. So um, we got busted. <laughs> I got suspended for a week. <laughs> Two that tops close. my story. Cops showed up at my house. My dad and my dad, after they left, my dad, to his credit, looked at me and said, "Now that was very, very, very cre- uh, clever. Don't do that again." <laughs> have you, have you, by chance, happened to see that show Scorpion? No, no, I haven't. There's a show Scorpion. It's literally it's it's the weirdest like sort of uh, crime solving FBI show you've ever seen. It's about a group huh. of genius hackers, basically. Oh, and I the check story that, out. that the story that you just told is. And it's supposedly it's supposedly based on um, <laughs> a true guy, and is a uh, huh? his IQ is like one ninety four. Walter O'Brien, oh, man, wow. And uh, but they the the story that you described, they've actually had happen in the show. Wow, that's not not identical. Yeah, and then, yeah, then, no, the, only, cool. then the only uh, other real involvement. Well, I mean, again, other than you know day to day living on the computer now. Yeah. Um, yeah. I got I got a crash course in the internet history with a company called um, Rena, and Rena huh. was created by John Day, who is one of the original uh, guys who came up with the ARPNET, and huh. he warned everyone at the time they were developing this, Vinsurf and others, that uh, this wasn't going to work. As soon as you brought a load on, it was going to crash, and sure enough, as soon as they brought the bases on, it crashed. Then you fast forward to 82, um, they're right. going to go public. He's again warning, don't do this. And at this time, according to the story that I was told, uh, Vince Cerf agreed with him. But millions and millions of dollars have been spent, and so they moved ahead. Then fast forward to 93, they now mobile and all operating off the same flawed architecture. So John at that point went back to the uh, Blackboard and said, you know, where did we go wrong on this? And he realized that he split this that back in the late 60s, early 70s, they split the stacks of information in the wrong way. So he came up with this recursive technology that uh, is basically almost entirely insecure unless somebody's actually on your machine. Um, huh. It's almost within reason infinitely scalable. And it, as far as speed, it, uh, is, it, the way it was described to me is right now the internet boils the entire ocean all at once when you really, and what Rena does is it only takes and boils it where it needs to be boiled. Huh. That sounds so, very, that sounds interesting. Yeah, it's very cool. So we're, we're that's my my limit of uh, tech background. I, I I sound great telling <laughs> that story. I only understand about half of what it means, but <laughs> right. <laughs> so cool. and then you 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 went from um it, it, the other thing that amazed me as I was reading your bio is uh, just there were a lot of things I felt sort of a kindred spirit with. I'm I'm also a filmmaker. Uh, mm. Love comic books growing up. <laughs> so, how did you go? Uh, you went to art school, and then uh, what were some of your first projects? Did you go right into film, or you know, I, I was, I, you know, I was actually I went to school thinking I would study physics, um, like my father. And when I got there, I just realized I didn't want to do that. Walked into the dean's office and told him I was dropping out. Um, and he said, well, what have you been spending your time doing? <laughs> I said, well, I'm making movies and taking pictures. He said, why don't you do an art major? So I switched to art and enjoyed it. And when I got out of college, uh, I was photographing for a living a little, for a little while. And, uh, and I really got into filmmaking. And It was sort of during the 90s independent film explosion, you know. Mm-hmm. So I, um, I was shooting thir- uh, 16, I'm uh, sorry, uh, yeah, 16 millimeter films, and um, in order to afford that, because the films I made would tend to get, they get distributed, and I would make like you know exactly five thousand dollars less than they cost usually back in, in income. So I, I, uh, I would kind of start these businesses on the side, and that was kind of my job. But what I was really doing was running these businesses, and I was making films, and and I was photographing, and then I was writing screenplays for a little while for money. But I kept going back to business, um, mostly because I like to make stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was, I think that's what happened in art school. And, and what really was, the story of my life is I like to make things. I like to do things with people. Like as a kid, I, it's, it's, I'm like a grown-up that still has that, that thing where I just I want everyone who's brilliant I know to come out and play with me. And the way I figured out I could do that, being, also being someone with a problem with authority, 
um, <laughs> was to start my own business. And and over and over, I discovered that I was I kind of had a talent for it. So I think the businesses were and have been a way for me to get to create great stuff and make a living doing it. Uh, sometimes I call it extreme freelance. You know, it's like, it's like being freelance, but you actually have to make the business to hire yourself to do it. I know the feeling. Yeah, totally. But I didn't get to be a stripper. That sounds amazing. You know, the, you, you want to know the great takeaway from that, um, yeah. other, than, other than the great takeaway from being that, uh, was that it really, <laughs> and this is something I didn't think about at the time I was doing it, but now and for a while I, I've had this perspective on it, is it really gave me the f- understanding of what it felt like to be objectified. And so right. as I went into, you know, doing, unfortunately I moved down to the Bay Area in 85 looking for the 60s, mm-hmm. 20 years too late. And right. what I found instead was exactly what I wasn't looking for, which is little LA and a hairband scene here, which the most misogynistic group of men you've ever been around. Mm. And it really gave me a different sense when I was interacting, uh, you know, with women to have a lot more understanding and respect than uh, a lot of the guys around me. And I and I really cherished that experience for that reason, amongst a, a great many other encounters that came out of it. <laughs> well, that's a great insight. Yeah, it's a great. So yeah, it's, a but, great, it's actually it's a really it's a it's a uh, great quality to be able to take take something like that away from an experience like that and make something out of it, you know? Well, I, really I, cool. I think that um, I, I look at, um, you know, my, my life and uh, far from perfect and a lot of uh, years spent sort of in shadow, if you will. And, and I really wouldn't change anything because um, I realize it's made me who I am today and not to sound, you know, sort of trite, but... Um, I, I, I'll go back through history and say, well, I'm going to take this piece out. Well, if I'd done that, then, you know, there's no uh, certainty that I would be who I am today. And it also, when I'm talking to people or uh, working on helping people with problems, um, to have that shared experience, when you say you understand and it comes from maybe in, uh, a place of true compassion, that's one yeah. thing. But when it's an actual shared experience, it makes a difference. Yeah, well, it's like saying there's a really big difference between heartbreak and regret, you know? And we can still do things that break our hearts and break our hearts if we were part of them. But that's really different than um, than regret, which is wishing that didn't happen. And that, to me, generally, I think maybe that's what you're saying, too. It, it really means that you haven't really integrated and made use of that experience. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So tell me about, uh, there's two of your movies here, uh, 93 Million Miles. What was that about? I'm sorry I wasn't familiar with it, but I figured we could talk about it. Yeah, no, that's okay. Yeah, it was... Uh, I'm assuming was, The Sun. Uh, yeah, it was 93 Million Miles from The Sun, and it was a film about, we shot it at night in San Francisco, actually. Um, and uh, it was a feature film, and it went all over the world, and, and theaters here, too. And uh, it was about for uh, people kind of finding themselves at, in San Francisco. It took place from sunri- sun, I guess, sunset to sunrise. Mm-hmm. So it was, it was really fun to do. We used we had really, really fantastic actors in it. Oh, that's cool. Is it, yeah. is it, uh, can you find it on Netflix or anything or? You, you can't, um, you can't now. It, it was, it was on the internet for a while in like early versions of the internet. I don't really know what, happened to it there was a, i mean meaning i do know what happened to it there was a distribution distribution company that was handling it but it was that was a while ago and i just haven't paid much attention to it after so long and and then ultraviolet what was that about that was funny that was a completely different thing i shot that in new york city and i'd been obsessed with um uh hong kong action movies believe it mm-hmm. or not so it was it was actually uh <laughs> it was actually a, a short action movie about a drug addict, a drug addict, a drug addicted killer uh, who lived in the subways um, and who ended up falling in love with one of his victims. And it was, uh, I, I think that was pretty cool. That was a lot more visual than the other one. Oh, actually, they were both pretty visual. But it was a very, it was a, somewhere between an action movie and an art film together. And that was really a blast to make. So uh, did did it have a happy ending? 
It did not have a happy ending. No, I can't imagine. That. <laughs> but, but that's but that's it definitely. Looked, but it was, it, it was Sorry. fun, though. <laughs> it's definitely that's definitely a unique take on the love story. Yeah, well, it was kind of a kind of a tragedy, you know, because he was basically fell in love with one of his victims who ended up killing him. So it had a nice twist. So are you are you making any movies right now? I'm not really. I mean, I, I'd say we've made three films for the bicycle company, but I actually had other directors do it. I'm sort of at, at the stage right now, and this may shift again for me, but um, I, you know, I'm so busy with LO and so busy with the bike company that I don't have that much time actually to do that, do things like that myself. But that right. may shift. That may shift again. So we'll I, I'm 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 looking forward to getting to the point where I don't have to do quite so much myself because I, I've, I've yeah. um, I produced. <laughs> um, I create, co-created the show Weed Country for Discovery about the medical marijuana industry here in oh, really? um, California oh, cool. a couple years ago. It, it did well. We had 1.1 million viewers per week. Had it been about any other yeah. subject, Discovery would have kept it on. But we did get the story about childhood epilepsy out there. And then mm-hmm. um, it's funny you did a lot of your films on 16 millimeter. I'm surprisingly enough producing a film about counterfeit olive oil. Uh, with a young huh. director who is just adamant about shooting on 16 millimeter, despite it making absolutely no sense at all. At this point. Yeah, but you know, it, it, it it's more expensive. But uh, ironically, if you if you go to the Budnitz Bicycles website and you look at our look at our uh, all three of those films were shot in 16. Mm-hmm. So actually, I think one of them was actually 35, honestly. Yeah. But the other ones, they were all shot on film anyway. So. Well, they shot Fruitvale Station on 16 millimeter, and and and, and I guess it looks the, great. The thinking came down to me, and I um, a, a friend of mine is a guy named uh, Bill Kinder who used well. He actually um, um, built from the ground up Pixar's post production department, and huh. and he and I had worked on another film together, and I mentioned we were doing this on 16 millimeter, and saying you know pretty much the consensus is that for an ultra low budget SAG film, this doesn't make a lot of sense. Right. Um, and we so we were talking about Fruitvale Station, and ultimately the question for me as a producer to Bill came down to this because there are so many as you know so many effects you can put on your film, it, it can or your digital footage, it can look pretty much very close to film. Uh, maybe not yeah. exact to the discerning eye, but like I asked Bill, I said, you know, would it have made a difference to 90% of the audience? And he said, mm-hmm. absolutely not. And so mm-hmm. for me thinking, okay, I can get, take $20,000 and put that into getting named talent that can help with distribution, that made a little right. bit more sense to me. Right, no, I hear you. I, but I, 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 I think it is going to look great. It, you know, it's an aesthetic thing and it's, yeah. The way film film does look different and the way lenses work with film because of the size of the image being projected projected on can look really different. But there's a lot of great stuff that is you know, you can do such great stuff with video nowadays and it's so so advanced that uh, as you said, you know, it just depends on the aesthetic you're looking for. No, and, and I also think there's something to be said if even if you're not um going to shoot on film, uh you know, for whatever reason the future of your career it makes a lot of sense to know how to do that, especially, I think, um, for still photography. I think learning how to work in the dark room, learning how to work with film, not knowing how to yeah. do those things, I, I think you lose something. And I also think not having your negatives and things like that is... Um, my my uh, wife who passed away was a photographer, and I've talked mm-hmm. to a lot of photographers, and there there definitely is something lost there, for sure. Right, right, yeah. It's, you know, everything's what it is. It's all different, so... So after you made your films, you before um, the bicycles because that's fairly yeah. recent. What did you do next? Yeah. Well, it wasn't one thing. You know, these things really overlap, so it's hard to say one thing to the other. You know, I I was doing all that stuff when I was making films, and to support my filmmaking habit, I was running businesses, and those businesses were things I cared about. I don't really know how to make a business except other things I fall in love with. And in a weird way, a friend and I fell in love with blue jeans. So we had a business where we were, uh, oh, before that, actually, I had a, another one with a with a friend of mine. We were putting our artwork on T-shirts and other clothing. We had, like, I guess you'd call it a little fashion brand, although it was really mostly T-shirts but and other stuff. But it was pretty far-out stuff, and, and that did fairly well. And then, uh, then I moved to Prague for a little while for fun, and then I moved back. 
I was shooting, I was photographing there and doing some other stuff. Moved back to the Bay Area and then um, started a company where we bought used Levi's and sold them overseas to Japan for thousands of dollars. It was awesome. So we were buying vintage Levi's and leather jackets and uh, vintage tennis shoes and all kinds of stuff. The Japanese were crazy for it, and the market was like 10,000%. So we, we kind of made a bunch of money doing that, and I would then spend it all making another movie. <laughs> 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 and that, would, that went on for a while, and then I started a company called Mini Disco because I'm still in the filmmaking. I was using... Um, mini disc players to do digital sound recording before uh, the iPod and, and a lot of digital recorders came out. We had hacked, we, we had basically hacked mini disc players to make them read writable. And then we hacked microphones to work with them. And then we, we were using all kinds of kind of interesting hidden mics and all kinds. Anyway, we, we created this, I created a, a, an early internet business and it started in 97 um, selling mini disc players that, that had been hacked and all kinds of weird stuff online. And that did, pretty well and again I was that was helping me make movies and do other stuff following that somehow there are other things mixed in there I think but I, uh, I started a company called Kid Robot to make um, really making high end toys that were designed by fine artists and graffiti artists and uh, who are all my friends and myself as well and that grew to actually be a fairly big company I mean we had 120 employees and stores in six cities and a dozen of my designs now are in the Museum of Modern Art so wow. that was pretty cool yeah that was, that was really fun um, so I did that for a while <laughs> and then um, and what else was I doing mixed in with that and, and then so the bike bicycle company kind of overlapped then I sold that company I just felt like I was repeating myself after a while so it was time to do something new I started the bicycle company and then started Ello more recently so, uh, yeah, I've done all kinds of different things. And I'm, I'm sure there's some stuff in there I forgot, too. Well, what is, um, before we get into Ello and stuff, what, tell, tell yeah. um if you want to, it, it'd be great to know a little bit, um, this show I oftentimes will take a spiritual bent. Uh, what, what are your spiritual yeah, understandings? Or where do you come from on that level? Well, uh, I've had a meditation practice for 20 years. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I was recently interviewed by Shambhala's son, and they asked me if I was a Buddhist, and I said no. Um, but I sat in a, I guess, in a Buddhist setting and in, in um, Zen centers mm-hmm. for quite a long time. So, uh, so I guess that would be my bent. Um, I grew up Jewish, um, but I never found I, I just really never found much in American Judaism, to be honest. It felt, you know, was, I actually grew up in an Orthodox house, um, in a kosher house, and went to a synagogue where the men and women still stand separately, all that kind of stuff. So, uh, I, I don't know if that's enough of an answer. Oh, no, that's fine. I just, I, I noticed the, the Hundred Monkeys quote, so... I was oh, uh, yeah. just sort of a little bit uh, curious. I, I was actually confirmed Zion Lutheran, and that real... Huh. Be- before I was, I, I, by the time I was ten, I was going. You know, none of this really makes any sense, <laughs> right? Uh, for a lot yeah. of reasons. But but at the same time, I I've learned not to demonize religion because I think that foundationally, most religions really have some good core values, and there's a lot of people that are just seeking. Um, yeah. And then I find I find sort of organically that I fall into um, you know I, I guess a Buddhist mold um, you know mm-hmm. from really looking to teachers like Joseph Campbell especially and then lately yeah. I've been listening to I've listened cool to guy. I got from KPFA I got fifty four hours of Alan Watts lectures. Oh man, how awesome! I didn't know you could do that. Oh uh, yeah, just for donating so cool. uh, donating to the station. They are so cool. It's just like while well, I'm working on the computer, I just got Alan Watts going. So if I wasn't a yeah. Buddhist before, I am now. <laughs> Yeah, you know what? You know, I'd say my take on religion is this: um, I think that if if life were, I, I think if there were a secret or an answer to life, you know, that were clear and obvious, mm-hmm. I think someone would have, after everyone thinking about it all these years, mm-hmm. someone would have discovered it by now, mm-hmm. and we don't know what it is. But on the other hand, if I think if life were totally meaningless, then I think by now someone would have discovered that and that would be clear to us as well. And I'm, 
I'm kind of at the place where um, maybe both things at once, <laughs> you know, oh. maybe life is both completely meaningful and completely meaningless. And, uh, and I think, I don't know, but my experience is that faith is very important. I, I don't, I actually don't know how, um, I, I, I wouldn't know how to live without it. Right. And as I get older, the, the objects in which I put faith become less and less clear. Mm-hmm. And in that happening, they be, I think they become more profound. So, right. Well, I, I had... My, and this is my experience anyway. I, I, I agree with you. Um, with pretty much everything you just said, uh, my, my sort of foundational thinking came when um, I was 12 years old. My dad and I had gone to a football game in Seattle. I got home. And, you know, again, I was in a town of 3,000 people. You didn't have out-of-body experiences. You didn't uh, mm-hmm. out, have astral projection. And I hadn't done any drugs yet. And um, I, I left my body floated out over my bedroom, out of the house, out of the solar system. Mm-hmm. Each way, it's like taking this in, out of the galaxy, out of the universe. And mm-hmm. I was looking back in at the universe, and I saw how the flow and every, how everything worked. I saw all the different components to it, and it was finite. I could fit that in my head. And then I was turned out towards infinity, and that became my foundation for my thinking the rest of my life. And I didn't really understand that that was an unusual perspective to have. Um, and it turns out, you know, it, it really, it is once you, um, because like you said there, to me, there isn't an, an ultimate answer. In fact, uh, Joseph Campbell in, um, the power of myth talks about an ancient Sanskrit quote, those who, and I'm paraphrasing, those who say they know don't, and those who say they don't know do. And, right. and I think it's really that it's like infinity is an absolute there. It can't not be. And because it is what it is, I could from my perspective, live a trillion existences and be no closer towards that ending than I am now. Right. Right. That's beautiful. You know, and then years later, I also came to sort of feel that um, love in some ways is synonymous with infinity in the sense that it's one of these incomprehensible things that we will never really understand fully what it is. But I sort of look at... um, Infinity as you have this infinite amount of information out there um, Mm -hmm. that is shaped into all these different realities and illusions that we experience. And then you've got this infinite energy source that that actually binds and brings all these things together. Um, and gives them, I, I call it the tapestry theory of infinity. But anyway, it, it, and I think that is love. I think it's the thing that brings all these other, all this information and is the story behind, is the thing that actually brings all the components together. Right, right. You know. I think, well, I, you know, it's interesting what you said because to me the, well, I, you know, I, I think that one of the things that we get caught in and it seems like, you're kind of saying the same thing is that we have there's a tendency to get caught in understanding and to assume that we can understand these experiences we have or that we can understand and then therefore have an explanation for what's going on. Right. But if you let go of the idea that you can really understand and really explain things and that, and that you should be able to understand it and explain things, then you really start to relax right. into really not knowing, you know? And uh, absolutely, that's a very powerful position to be in. Actually, it's a, it's a really wonderful way to live because and, and, it takes a lot of stress away, and it well, and it probably jives with the real experience of life. Like you know, we can't really explain so much of what we experience. I can I can fully accept the unknown. I'm pretty comfortable with what is being what is. What I what I really still sort of struggle with, and in, in large part, what motivates me uh, to do the mm-hmm. show and some of the work I'm yeah. doing, is I I have a hard time with the suffering, misery, and pain. Even though um, I can understand philosophically that it's an illusion, a chosen experience, and everything is perfect as it is. Blah blah blah. When you see other people that are having not. these experiences as real, <laughs> it's hard to take. It's hard to take. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally, and you, and maybe it's not all a perfect the way it is, you know, and maybe that's okay too. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of really crappy experience out there, I think. And then, and, and then I think what? That's also what, okay, you know. Then what defines perfection? You know, it's like I I don't know. You know, I I think we have a lot of things that we, you know, and when I talk about I think pain and suffering and misery, I'm not talking about cosmic events or natural events. I'm talking about the things we do to one another that don't have to occur. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I think Trungpa and Rinpoche made a distinction between necessary and unnecessary suffering, you know. And it's, and you know, necessary suffering is, you know, if you, if you burn your hand, it's going to hurt. Right. Um, unnecessary suffering is thinking that it shouldn't hurt. Right. Or, or unnecessary. That you shouldn't have burned your hand. Or unnecessary suffering is going back and putting your hand on the burner again and wondering why it hurts. Yeah, man, I think that's just stupid, actually. <laughs> well, then I think I think you could look at a large force of human civilization as being kind of stupid. Because we keep going back to the burner. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, I, I see that happening, too. And I do that myself. <laughs> why did I do that again? <laughs> yeah, I, I kind you know, Einstein did have it right. You know, the definition of insanity totally i totally agree and and i and i would say that the willingness to take a look at our lives and saying why am i doing this like what is going just asking that question over and over and over it's just a really it's really i think the only way to live you know well, and you, and you know what <laughs> and, and, and and paul you know you know my my thinking is at, at this point and it'll probably change tomorrow my thinking is that the what and the why doesn't matter nearly as much as the how. It's like what and why we may never entirely figure out. Um, right. But the how, once you're in a chosen experience that you have uh, are having, or even if you're an atheist and this is your one go around, then isn't it most important how we choose to be, not why yeah. we are being or what we are being, but how we are being? Totally. I mean, like, think it, another way to say it, it's so funny you're saying this because I said something really similar the other day to someone. It's it's that you know we we can go through life right and we can think anything we want to think. We can, and and we and you know we can't always control our thoughts nor our impulses. So sometimes we think really bad things. I mean things that that <laughs> would hurt other people if it was you know or that we would want to or all this stuff. But what really the only thing that really matters is what we do, how we act. You know, and, and children really teach you that. I have a daughter, and and the only thing that matters is how I act toward her. It doesn't matter what I think or what I feel. And as we, and I think the definition of maturity is really the willingness to act appropriately, regardless of how we feel inside. Because a lot of us who grew up in America in the, whatever the 70s or the 80s, or the 90s, I guess, and, um, there's a lot of trauma. You know. And that trauma just gets built into our system. And to me, to me, it's just like, are we willing to act responsibly? And I, basically, I, I don't care what people think. I just care how they act. And, right. and that's something that's very clear and that I can judge and I can say, no, you can do better. You know, and I can do that with myself. Right. And that, and that, and that was something that actually in one of um, Alan Watts' interview, he, he was talking about from a Buddhist perspective, is that's sort of where... Some religions, Christianity, Islam, uh, a little bit cross the line into saying it's not just your actions that are bad; it's your thoughts that are bad as well. And yeah, that's, that's and a pretty that's, a, that's a pretty high bar <laughs> to set. It, it it is, man, and and it's really like it just it creates a it creates a situation where you sort of are bad and you're stuck being bad and there's nothing you can do about it. Or actually, you know, if we one of the interesting things is if we stop denying who we are and all the parts of who we are, mm-hmm. all the things we feel, even the parts of the things that we feel that we don't like, you know, um, then then actually we start to have power over them in the way that we act. You know, we're not so subject to them because we're not reacting to those things anymore. So if I have an impulse that says, God, this guy on the radio with me is a jerk or something. <laughs> isn't happening. But if I thought that and I acted on that, it probably wouldn't serve the situation, right? Right. Um, but instead, you, because if I if I can just show up, then suddenly I can go. Oh, I don't I don't actually want to act on that because this is a great competition. By the way, I think you're great. That isn't what I'm saying, but, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I, 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 yeah, I thought it was then. going well. <laughs> You'll have to excuse well. my voice today. By the way, I'm that only example. slightly hoarse. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, I, and I, I think in a lot of ways, like with all, and people say like, how do you do all these different things, and how do you do them well? And a lot of the times I say, I really have no idea. But I would say that anyone who spends time with me knows, like, I'm a completely crazy, neurotic person, probably more so than anyone else, and yet 
I think a bit more than many people, I have the ability to just um, kind of step over that and do what's needed in the moment, regardless of how I feel about it, regardless of whether or not I want to do it, regardless of how I, you know, how I feel like in the moment, like whether or not I just want to stay in bed today, I still just get up. You, 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 you touched on you touched on something really important by saying when people ask you how you do all these things, you say I don't know, yeah. and and it's interesting because that's something that I've been giving a little bit of thought to lately. Is there's been more and more research done that's showing that the peak human experience or human beings acting at their peak potential really mm-hmm. comes when they're in that zone when they're not consciously thinking. So then that right. begs the question of: Is it really an evolutionary advantage that we're aware of our thoughts? <laughs> Right. If, if our peak, if our peak performance is when we're not thinking and we're in that zone and we're just being, not thinking right. and doing, but just being and then doing, um, is it really an evolutionary advantage or just, or just the fascinating <laughs> to extinction? I don't know. I think it's. I. I mean, my experience would be that it is a great advantage at the appropriate time. You know. Right. So there are times to act completely instinctually, and then we know what to do. We know the right thing, and there are times to sit back and plan. The problem right. is that if we're walking around terrified about what's going to happen in a situation where we don't, our terror about what's going to happen isn't really doing us any good, right. right? And then we're letting that terror run us. I mean, frankly, I'm people, I mean, I, I, I start all these businesses, I do all this stuff, and I'm scared a lot of the time. I'm actually a, a fear-oriented person. So the, the question is, am I going to let that fear run me, or am I just going to be scared? And if I'm just scared, it's no big deal. You know, I can walk around and people say, how are things going? I'm really terrified right now, but I'm going to keep on, I guess I'm just going to go and do my work, you know? So I think it's okay to think about it. The problem is, is when you take the, those thoughts seriously and especially at the wrong time, right. you know? So I think that there are times for both. It's just the balance. Well, and, and you know, and the, the thing that you have done in your life that, and I'm really glad you said that because it's something important to share with the audience is the opposite of fear isn't love because to my mind at least everything is love um the reason we will experience love is discomfort sometimes is because we're not in and again this is my theory we're we're not in harmony we're not in tune with the experience that we've chose to come to have this experience has rules of nature laws of physics that and and there are things that we're not at one with right now and so we're experiencing right. a lot of discomfort but it's not because it's not love but the anyway the opposite of fear to my mind is courage which is what you have uh, is, hmm. is I, you're able to yeah, step I, through the fear I wouldn't have thought that 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 way I would say I, I would think the opposite of fear is you think about that the opposite of fear is courage I, I guess to me like and maybe that that I would say that courage and fear are linked. Mm-hmm. You know, like you don't you don't get to have one without the other. Just like right. you don't get to really have love without heartbreak. You you can't right. have it. It's not a. We we often you know I I often say to people about our bicycles that part of my goal is to build a bicycle that's so wonderful that you fall in love with it, so that you have the privilege of having your heart broken when you lose it when it's stolen, when it's lost, or when it breaks, or when, when, or when something happens to it, you know? Because owning things and, and really getting to fall in love with them nowadays is a rare thing, especially when you can buy so much cheap junk at Walmart or whatever, you know? It's like to actually own beautiful things, to, to let yourself care about them so much that when they leave, you're heartbroken. I mean, that's like so rare. And, and I don't know, so to me, it's like love and heartbreak are connected. And I guess I would say, like you said, fear and courage are connected, but you don't get to have courage unless you're terrified. You can't well, just, just be courageous, you know? No, no, no. I mean, what would there be? But again, that's sort of the curse of a, of an existence by comparison, this duality that, you know, it, the way I s- sort of feel about this absolute consciousness, if you want to call it God, whatever name you want to put on this infinite thing that's out there that we're all a part of ultimately – can only have these ideas in the in the abstract. So it has to create these existences by comparison, these dualities, mm-hmm. good and bad, fear and courage, in order to actually be able to experience uh, these things that it could only be conceptualized in the abstract um, if as the absolute oneness, infinite consciousness, whatever, however you want to look at it. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think if I understand you, I agree. I mean, it just seems to me like people think that, for example, if they want, let's say you wanted to go start your own business, which I've done a lot of, right? And they think that they shouldn't be afraid to do it. But actually, you should be afraid. It's a scary thing to do. And Terrifying. it's just that being afraid isn't a problem. There's no problem with being afraid. And courage is allowing yourself to actually just be afraid and then just go act anyway. If right. you weren't afraid, you're just stupid. And, right. you know, that is because, or you're not taking any real risks, which is which might be a nice position to be in, but I've never been in that position, you know? So to me, it, it, they're... I, I think that like when people say, oh, these things are all one, what it really means is that one comes with the other. You don't get to have one without the other. You don't get to have, I don't know, you, you don't get to have joy without having times when there's an absence of joy. You know, it's just, and, and when you realize that, I remember I was in a, a retreat at the Salt Lake City Zen Center a while back, and I don't remember what had happened, but I was just crying and crying and crying. Something had happened in the, in the retreat. I'd realized something, and I was just crying and crying and crying. And uh, Zen master there at the time, Genpo Roshi, walked over to me and he said, no, he didn't even, he didn't give a shit. <laughs> this is a guy who really doesn't give a shit about much, really. It's just one of his gifts, I think. And he just walked over, very callously said, you know, oh, that'll pass too, and walked away. And I realized that, yeah, man, that sadness was yeah. going to pass, and it was a relief. You know, it was a relief. It was, it was and, like, and, oh, yeah, that's going to go, you know, cool. And, and then it, all and the good it, stuff goes, too, and that's cool, too. And it really does pass, and, and the whole idea of being in the moment is, is such an important thing, to allow yourself yeah. to experience the moment, realize that it is, that that's all you've really got, good, bad, indifferent, experience the moment. These are what make totally. up your life. You know, the yeah, the future totally. hasn't, the 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 past literally doesn't exist anymore so don't you know harbor regret learn what you can move on and the future you know it's like you can plan um you can plan but it it's you know a lot of times life will lead you exactly where you need to be not always where you want to be to not to rip yeah. off the stones too much but before we run out of time <laughs> let's talk about LO and why you put uh, this sure. great new uh platform together for us all to communicate through yeah, because I, my friends and I discovered that we weren't using any of the other social networks anymore. We we just found the experience we just found the experience to be cluttered. Um, we we just weren't having fun talking to each other. There were all these boosted posts. Suddenly there were all these advertisements. Facebook for some reason had decided that I was a middle aged woman of color, so I was getting all these <laughs> really interesting ads for things I would never want. And uh, it was like. It just had become a drag. And then there's all this privacy stuff where you realize, okay, so here's the deal, right? Here's the deal you're being offered. If, in exchange for getting to use this social network, you're going to give us all this data about you. You're going to tell us your real name because we're going to force you to tell us your real name, your age, your sex, your marital status, all that kind of stuff. You're going to tell us everyone you know. You're going to tell us uh, everything that you type and post about your life because we're going to read it, right? You're going to tell us what you like because you're going to hit a like button. We're going to track you as you buy things as you go around the Internet. And so we're going to learn all this stuff about you, and then we're going to use all that data. We're going to save it on servers that God knows what happens to it, and then we're going to sell it so we can show you ads. And yeah. I just think that's creepy. Yeah, I, and, I, I think you, it's, and I also just think it's not a really very good deal. You and I are 100% <laughs> you know? on the same page. I, I mean, not, a that, rip-off. Yeah, and well, and, yeah. and and it's really it, it's taking advantage of your customer base and the people that that really built your business for you that you wouldn't have a business for to now go back to the well and double dip totally. on them. I I find really obscene. And one of the scariest yeah. things I found is you know I've got a, a pretty good social media presence, and all of a sudden I woke up to Facebook one day telling me that I had to prove I was a real person after five years doing the same exact thing. So I just oh, did that happen to you too? Yeah, totally. driver's license and everything. Now, what freaked me out is I got on to a friend's thing. Not only wasn't I on anymore right now, yeah. I was gone historically from everywhere. And I've told people about that. And that's a little bit scary. You can just be erased entirely. Totally. Well, and, but the other question is ask yourself why they're doing that, right? Because Facebook will tell you that they're doing it because it's a, uh, they want to keep it safe for everyone. They want everyone to be a real person, you know, all that. But what's really going on is that, 
if you tell them who you really are, your real name, you become very valuable to them, especially if you use, think about it, you use Facebook your whole life and they're tracking everything you do. They're creating a little virtual you out there in cyberspace that they can sell. They know what you like, what you want to buy, what you have buy, what your friends buy, and they can advertise to you and also advertise the things you like to the friends that you're, that you, that you're in, in contact with. So it's a, you know, and a lot of people don't really care about all that. And quite honestly, like, it's, it's okay not to care about all that. In a, in a certain respect, you're like, yeah, yeah, fine, but I don't really care about all that because, you know, I'm getting this service for free. Well, here's the thing. The reality is that the, that service you're getting for free isn't really so great anymore, right? right. It's, it's full of ads. And then when you, when, you, when you type something you hope your friends will see, a small, it gets to a small percentage of them because they're sticking boosted posts and all kind of, kind of other stuff in there instead. So we created Allo, actually it's a private social network. There were about 100 artists on it. We were all friends. We invited a bunch of our friends. And we, we actually built it as a totally private social network and used it for about a year. And the only problem was that at the end of about a year, there were a few thousand people that wanted to get on. And we hadn't built it to scale, so we, we rebuilt it. We launched it in August, invited the same 90 people to start, just to start it out. And um, three weeks later, we blew up, and, we, and it's been like four and a half months now, I think, and we have millions of users. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's, um, it's very cool. It's everything that I and friends have talked about wanting with social media is something that's simple, clean, only gives you just exactly what you need. Um, now, if we can just figure one platform where we can bring everything together, so you, because the other problem I'm yeah. having with social media right now is yeah. nobody's communicating one specific way. You've got people communicating through Facebook. You've got people messaging right. you through Twitter, uh, you yeah. know, Google Plus. You name it, and it's like I, I miss messages all the time. It's like there's no way to keep totally. up with this. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that is complicated. I don't know. I, I mean, I'm a special case maybe, but I'm just using this network. It's, it's very simple, like you said, and, um, and it's still beta, you know. It's invitation only. You can only get on if you're invited by someone else who's on the network. You can request an invite on the homepage. You just have to wait a little while and you will get on. But it's, um, we're, keeping it, we're keeping it kind of close while we're still developing it, and it, it'll be out of beta about the time the, the mobile apps come out in a few months, and then, awesome. then I think things will really open up. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. Well, I'm really anyway, enjoying it, and I'm really enjoying it, and I can't thank you enough. Um, you know, and when you're ready, uh, just let me know as far as getting the word out, and I'll invite a ton of people to come over. Um, you know, uh, put put out thank a message you. to to. Uh, you know, all of the listeners and, uh, you know, when, when you guys are ready to open up, just let me know. But I, I love what you're doing. I love your history. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, it's, this is really needed. Um, real quickly before we wrap up, what do you see sure. as the future for social media and also the um, where you see, because I know in um, the interview you did with Fox, the economic yeah. issue came up and just, you know, uh, Put into a, a, a simple statement. <laughs> uh, the, well, the future of social media. Quite honestly, I, I think things are. I think people are going to start to demand more than they already are, um, and better services. So, uh, I think you're going to see a lot, not just in social media, but a lot of new stuff on the internet that's not not advertising supported. Not not because people care overly much about ads, but because I think it creates a better product. I think people are waking up to that. So I, I think that really is the future. And, and to me, the future is, has more to do with, um, you know, let me put it this way, you know, in the seventies, there were a few record companies and there were gigantic bands like Fleetwood Mac that made zillions of dollars and the little bands made no money at all, you know? And with the, right now there's just an explosion of so much music and, for better or for worse, everything's in transition. I have a lot of friends who are, who are musicians who are unhappy because of the fact that it's it's hard to make a living now. But what I do observe is that there are a lot of smaller bands that are making a regular living, right? As opposed to making zillions of dollars, right? And I think that what, so my what I would say is on the economic side of this is I think that things are going to break up. There won't there won't be just a few big networks um, like Facebook and. Twitter. I think there's going to be a lot of smaller ones, and I think that's going to create a lot more variety, and I think it's going to be really a good thing. 
And, and I think it's going to empower creatives, which is something that the world desperately yeah. needs because I really feel for the last couple hundred years, the, and, and again, it's not to demonize business at all, but just the, the importance that the, the money guys have put on their place in the process has become way overvalued and they've yeah. done a really good job of uh, marginalizing the creative thinkers, which that shouldn't be something that's always about profit. That's something that you need yeah. as a culture, as a civilization to drive you on, to, to come yeah, up totally. with the next great ideas. Yeah, totally. I mean, Ella is a public benefit corporation, so we have a mission. It's, we, you know, we have a public benefit mission. It's a, it's a new kind of corporation, for-profit corporation, actually, that lets you have a mission. So you're not just there to make money, and I think that's another thing that people will start to demand, that the companies that they interact with um, not just act responsibly, but enshrine legally that they will act responsibly. Well, I'd, I'd really like to thank you for coming on the show, Paul, and I hope we can stay in touch. Um, yeah, this was you. a really awesome conversation, and I, I, especially if you're still in the Bay Area. And at some point, I'll shoot over to uh, your uh, press person. I'll send over some information yeah. on Rena. You might find that interesting. That would be awesome. Yeah, I'm Vermont-based now, but oh, okay. uh, definitely, yeah, right. <laughs> it's cold here. But um, definitely, uh, yeah, definitely stay in touch, and, and it's been really great talking to you. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Paul, and I really appreciate uh, you taking time out of your busy schedule and sharing your story with us, and keep up all of, uh, keep the imagination flowing. Thank you. Same to you. Okay, take care, Paul. Bye. Okay. Yeah.